We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from fan of the show and patron Pax the Paladin, who writes, What are the quality of life improvements that publishers make to games that you appreciate most? Inspired by the gratitude I feel towards Stonemeyer games every time I consult the box cover diagram to put away Wingspan. Well, thanks for the great question, Pax, and for being one of our awesome Patreon patrons. You too could help support the show and help us cover the cost of things like Gleam by going to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Now, I thought this would be a fun discussion to have, though I am sad to say I still haven't played a physical copy of Wingspan, so I haven't seen that particular quality of life improvement to comment on it, but I have seen something similar. So by quality of life improvements, we mean things that improve the gameplay of a game, but that aren't actually required to play the game. The game would be perfectly playable and functional without them. They are things that improve the gameplay experience, which can very well also improve your enjoyment of the game. Yeah, these are things that it's not a a rule change. It's not additional miniatures. It's not um, extra dice included in the set. Well, extra dice might count. Um, What we're looking at here are more ephemeral things, things that aren't required to sit down and play the game. The game would work perfectly fine without them. As a really good example of something we've been playing, playing recently, though, though that to me isn't one of the best ones out there, but there is absolutely no reason Boop needs a quilted board to be able to play it, or even having the cat theme. That quilted board is a quality of life improvement. It's only there so the player's like, oh my god, it's got a quilted board. Look, it looks like I'm jumping on a bed. So I think we're going to talk about some of the quality of life improvements we've seen and the ones we would like to see more of, the the, the ones we most enjoy finding in a game. And I'm going to start with what Pax said uh, with the box cover diagram. Now, I hadn't seen this before until recently, and it was with Castle Panic, the big box. And this is so uncommon that I tried to fill the box on my own a couple times and failed then went online to Google how to fill it, was going through a thread of people sharing how they sorted it, only to get two pages in on Board Game Geek when someone said, look at the box top. And everyone in that thread was like, what? And sure enough, the box top for Castle Panic, big box, second edition technically, I assume first also had this, as a diagram of where to put everything in the box. Now, this in particular, I, I'd like, yes, box top, awesome, but just that, diagram a diagram that tells you where to put the inserts and where to put the components in the trays and where to sort the cards and where the dice should sit in the box is awesome it doesn't have to be the box top though i gotta say it's a brilliant place to put it another example would be uh eclipse second dawn for the galaxy actually has it on the side of the box where when you lift the lid of the game if you have it turned the right way it shows how to put all the trays inside other games i own i've had a sheet that says it. One of them, Anachrony, has a book that literally shows you how to layer all the different things inside and what goes where. Just some way that tells me how to sort it. I don't know how many games I've gotten where it's got some insert in it, and I look at it and I'm like, I have no idea what you expect me to put where. Like, uh, an example of that would be the My Little Pony deck building game, which we talked a lot about in the recent episodes. I found a way to fit everything. And it works great, but I have no idea if that's how the designer intended me to use it. So while it might increase your printing costs, it won't really add to materials. And especially with that inside of the box cover, it's otherwise wasted space. It's always nice to see when it's used by designers and publishers for some purpose that benefit the players. Though, I suppose it could be argued that those box toppers out there might get annoyed. Yeah, they can just write over top of the image or something. <laughs> Find somewhere else to put it. I, box toppers, I don't I wonder how many people actually box top. I, I kind of want to know that. If you're a box topper, hit us up. I want to know. Absolutely. I thought about it for a while. I thought it'd be a cool piece of history to be able to pull out a game and see all the different people I played it with. But I think what I'd rather do is just like come up with a sheet and put it in there. Maybe that's what we can do as a, a giveaway for signing up for our newsletter. We'll make a box topper sheet that people can tape into the top of their box. Mm. That way it works. So you just tape it or leave it in your box. Now, to me, the next level from giving me a diagram of where to put everything in an insert or, you know, not necessarily even an insert, but like any type of board organization, it can be, you know, trays that come out, you pass around is 
have the insert, have have the thing. Tell me what goes where. I love seeing this. Now I've seen this done where the plastic that the box insert is molded from and the various trays are molded from are is literally molded to show the various different symbols of like whatever the resource symbols or the playing piece symbols or the different faction symbols. I've also seen it done with stickers that you put onto the tray. I've also seen it with an overlay that goes inside the insert. And once, and I thought this was utterly brilliant, and I think it goes back to like a classic game called Titan, is an underlay where you put this piece of paper under your plastic tray and then it tells you what goes everywhere inside it. And like, that's not a new thing. Like that's an older game that does this. And I think it's brilliant. Yeah, and this could be done far more often as there have been a number of games we've seen where each mini has its own special space to keep it safe and tightly secured. But the difference between them is minuscule. So you don't realize that you've, until you've got the last one and it won't go in the, the spot, that they're all placed wrong and you need to juggle yes. them around until each one is in its proper spot randomly essentially uh -huh. yeah i definitely had that one pro tip if a game doesn't include one of these when you before you take your minis out grab your phone take a snap a picture and then if you're really fancy then go print that put it in the box but i did that for um i think it was villainous disney villainous i, I actually took a picture to figure out where they would go back because there were a couple that i couldn't tell the difference yeah i forget what it is but i, I clearly remember uh a, a couple of games where it's like you've got like five or six minis and and they all sort of fit into each one mm -hmm. but not quite yes. and so if you get three wrong you know your fourth one is never going to fit and you've got to yep. juggle them sorcerer sorcerer from CG cge was one yeah and uh big trouble in little china i remember that being a problem with as well or like uh, we had no clue where to yep. put them back now Let's take a step back, though, because we're kind of jumping the gun here. We're jumping ahead because honestly, just having an insert or some form of component organization can be a huge quality of life improvement. Game trays, bits, bins, uh, trays that hold every like player trays that have all their pieces. Um, anything else? Bowls include you don't tend to get bowls. I use bowls. Um, uh, any of those things that help sort the components. Even a well-designed cardboard box insert can be better than no insert or better than your trough insert that's created just to get the game shipped to you in good shape. These things help to get games played more often, which the Bellhaus first law is the best games in your collections are the ones that actually get played. So anything that helps with that is appreciated. These can help with setup and teardown time, which is a huge part of modern games. And they can also make the game flow or play better during the game because it's easier to reach things, it's easier to find things, and actually improve the actual gameplay experience. Now, to be fair, though, that's not always the case. There are times when an insert can actually slow things down and get in your way. So mm -hmm. publishers should not just think that, oh, we're going to put an insert in here, that will solve all of our problems. No, <laughs> if you don't think it through, you can actually make it worse then just having a trough would be there and letting the players figure out their own solution. Yeah. And sometimes the way they, uh, I've, I've had a couple publishers put out these inserts and more often like bit spins where they sort things different than I would. And I'm like, why wouldn't you just put all the money in one spot? You don't have to split up the ones, the fives, the tens and put them into hard to reach places. Just dump all the money in one spot, for example, or sorting, having a tray with the six different player colored cubes on that tray while meanwhile having separate things for all the rest of the player pieces. I'm like, well, we, wait, we're just going to pass this tray around and take them. Why not instead have five different trays for the five different players? So it's, it's definitely something I've seen. Yeah. So while we love having bowls handy, and we always do in our games, yeah. not needing them is a far better option. A game that comes with complete, with easy-to-play accessories isn't as rare as it once was, but it's still not quite as common, especially with yep. non-kickstarted games. Now, another one I'm going to call out that it's a minor version of this that I always appreciate, and I usually call it out in the unboxing. If you're not going to give me an insert, give me baggies. Yes, I have a ton of baggies, but I hate going through my bag of baggies to find the proper size. Give me the proper size baggies in the game. Do what I just said. Make sure you give me one baggie per player so I can put all of their stuff, everything you need at the start of the game in one bag so I can hand it to them. And give me other bags to sort the rest of the stuff. Uh, baggies are better than nothing. 
Well, I love a nice big insert. I also understand that's very expensive. Baggies are better than nothing. I appreciate any time a publisher includes baggies with their game. And while I have to say Mo may be, you know, somewhat different, uh, not all of us have a bag of baggies of different yes. sizes. Uh, so if you if you don't provide any, we may end up going with nasty Ziploc bags, which are rarely the best solution. You know, your yeah. snack bags and sandwich bags aren't the right solution for for the game pretty much ever. So uh, use <laughs> yeah. Uh, some some people not everyone has the 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 monster bag <laughs> all right moving away from from board game organization um i'm gonna go to another one which is another big one you know i'm, I'm gonna skip i'm, I'm gonna jump back a sec because we're talking about the stuff that goes in the game i'm gonna call out a um a, a one that i call out because i mentioned calling things out on my youtube channel when i'm doing unboxing so one i'm gonna call out is I always appreciate this is this total quality of life when the designer designs the box so that I can hold it vertically or I can stack it horizontally and I can read it either way. So on two sides of the box, it'll be set up one way and the opposite side of the box will be set up the other way. So I can store my game on my shelves behind me here, either vertically or horizontally and still be able to read the words on it, uh, the right side up. Now, I know that's a little picky thing, but honestly, it's one of those things that gives me great joy when I find it. And it's a little thing, but it's also a little thing for the designer and the publisher. You're going to be printing on all four sides, just making a quick design change so that it's readable horizontally or vertic and vertically isn't a mm -hmm. big change, but it can be a, a very nice touch for players. I'm going to call out something from Pax in the chat room since it is her question we're answering tonight that I, I like here. So it said, love a bunch of extra baggies in a game, but it's this part. It makes me feel like the publisher is thinking from a player perspective. And honestly, that's a big thing about all of the things we're going to mention tonight, that it kind of shows that like the, they understand their game's going to get played and how people play their game. So thank you for shouting that out. Now moving away from the box and organization, uh, probably the biggest one on this entire list, at least for me, and I think for many people, is summary sheets, summary cards, player aids, how getting the important information in the game in the player's hands for easy reference without having to ever have to reference a rule book and flip through it now these have to be useful you can't put everything that's in the rule book in one one sheet and expect that to be useful it's just too much information it has to be all of the required info for one but not too much and not missing anything i it doesn't help if you give me an icon reference but skip the six main resources because well you should remember them by now uh references for iconography uh big one deanna's favorite is something that lists the phases of the game the phases of around and individual player turn order what are the different steps you go through each round of the game which is so useful if you're playing a game that has multiples of these if you have 16 different things you can do on your turn, I'll, I'll call out Terra Mystica. If you have 13 different things you can do on your turn, give me a nice summary card that tells me what all 13 of those are so I don't forget one of them. Uh, another one that I like to see is end game scoring. End game scoring can be a great reminder. Hey, don't forget, it doesn't matter that this is, you can battle each other. What's really going to score at the end of the game is who controls the most areas. Yeah, and this is something that shouldn't just be on the back of the manual, the back of the rule book that one person has access to throughout the game, or you need to keep passing around the table, mm -hmm. give it out there. One of the things that I think publishers need to, to grasp is if you go to board game geek, every game that doesn't already have <laughs> player aids has got files of player pl player created player aids oh. in that board game geek directory. Players de are demanding this. This isn't a, a little every, you know, almost every game you run into gets player mm -hmm. aids created for it because publishers aren't doing this. So why? So, I mean, I guess in some ways publishers are like, well, they're going to do it. They're going to make them for us. Yeah. Why should I bother? But at the same time, it makes a lot of uh, gamers feel more appreciated if they don't have to go digging on yes. board game geek. Not to mention all the players who aren't at the high end of gaming and don't go to Board Game Geek for every little thing, who don't yes. automatically 
check the forums and check the file lists on board game geek we are the exception we're not the normal gamers yes. i'm sure there are still gamers out there who love games and love modern gaming but have never been to board game geek yeah there's people out there who've never heard of it and even if they did they're gonna go there and go this is way too much i don't i know board game Geek's gotten better since we started this show but that is still one messy site if you don't know how to use it or what you're looking for I'm pretty sure we actually have an episode called uh, Getting the the Best Most Out of the Geek. So you might want to check that up. I might, I might be off on that, but I'm pretty sure we have an episode on we've how We've definitely to discussed the geek. I don't yeah. know how deep we've gone in. I, I think there's an episode. I, I don't. I, maybe Deanna can pull this up in the chat room and I'll call it out if I'm correct. I, geeking out on the geek or geeking out about the geek, I think, is the name of the episode. So sounds, I'm trying sounds to familiar, remember yes. that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we've covered that. But it is not an easy site. But yes, uh, the fact that people are doing it, yeah, I get it. Like Publishers like, now, nah, well, someone will do it better. And we've also called out, I don't even know if they're still around because I haven't checked recently, but Esoteric Order of Gamers for making some of the best ones out there. There are some fantastic ones. But again, I still feel these should be in the box. Um, and, and honestly, some extra cards or sheets of paper shouldn't be that much of a cost increase to scare people away. Uh, make them black and white if you have to, if that's that big a deal. And the other thing is, include more than one like I, I yay i've got this awesome sheet of iconography it's fantastic except it's a five-player game and we're all playing simultaneous and need to know all the icons all the time while looking at our hands give me five copies or at least give me two or something I, like I, that I, so ideally I can... one for every two players so you can put them between yeah, two players least. that's the minimum really acceptable number is one for every two players yeah i agree now, another one is taking this uh, potentially a step further, and that is including the information you would normally put on a a player's hands, like in 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 like on a sheet or on a card, instead putting that on a board. So this was something that I learned watching an interview with Ian O'Toole, and it's part of how he designs graphic design for games and boards, is to put as much of the stuff as possible on the board that everyone's already staring at. Because you're going to spend most of the, well, depending on the game, um, you're either going to be staying, staring at your player board or the main board and try to put as much information as possible there. Now, by doing that, it's where everyone can see it, which is pretty cool. Um, and it also makes it so that everyone has equal access and there's no, can you pass that over? Now, of course, the problem is it could get busy. Yeah, the problem, uh, another problem you get to is that uh, depending on how many players there are, the size of your table and the orientation of the board uh, and, and how much information you're trying to get out there, there may be people who are struggling to read, you know, working from the opposite side of the board and, and trying mm -hmm. to read upside down and things like that. So while that is definitely a, a benefit, uh, as we talked, we've been talking a little bit lately about zones, uh, yes. getting it, that a, a closer zone to the player is going to be better. You want that information that they need at hand and not as too far away and, and definitely not into the six or seven, which is the manual or the box. So Deanna has found it. It was a bonus episode released in 2019, geeking out about the geek. Um, it's break room number one. If you go like tabletopbellhop.com slash podcast slash break room number one. If you Google geeking out about the geek tabletop bellhop, I'm sure you can find it. All right. Speaking of boards, we we're talking about the main board, the player boards and stuff like that. I love when a game comes with dual air boards. I, I it just, I, it, unless it's like absolutely required by the rules, but like, I'm talking about like extra bonus board that really wasn't needed to be there. So Katara is a great example of this because I, it is the first game I know of that actually comes with two different boards and technically three different sides. So there is a board for four players. Then there's a, you flip that over as a board for three players. And here's the neat one. They actually gave a smaller board for two players. And I love the fact that it's physically smaller. Like it'd be so much easier, I'm sure for publication purposes to keep all the boards the same size. But by having this smaller board, it means the game takes up less space when playing two players. And I'm like, that's really cool. I'm um, sorry if I said dual air, I meant dual sided boards. Another example of this is Tapestry. There are two different sides of the board for different player counts. Instead of, I don't know, I, one of the examples is Power Grid. The original Power Grid, when you play with less players, you have to remove regions from the map. 
Well, instead of doing that, have a dual layer board that gives you the different regions. Like just have a two player side and a three dual sided, side. not dual layer. Dual sided. <laughs> I keep saying layer. Sorry. Dual sided board. I always appreciate that. Another one, though, the power grid did get right is you want to double the replayability of your game. Put a different board on the other side. So power grid, when you buy it, because the game was made in Germany, has a map of the U.S. and has a map of Germany on the back. You get two totally different maps, and anyone who's played Tapestry knows just how different those feel. I definitely love having two-sided boards. Now, I'm going to call it a real quality of life one here, though, and that is unfair. Unfair has a double-sided board for if you all want to sit on the same side of the table or if you want to sit opposite each other. Like, honestly, that is the most quality of life improvement. Like, not best quality of life, but, like, the only reason that exists is quality of life. I'm like, that is just amazing. They give me a board if we are all sitting together on one side of the table or we're sitting opposite each other. That's just a cool one. And that was such a simple thing. They only needed one side of the board. They had a yep. blank side. And rather than shipping a blank side, they made a quick little change, printed the other side, and now you've got a, a benefit to your players for very little effort and cost on part of the publisher. Now, sticking with boards, but this time actually talking about player boards and dual layer boards, not dual sided boards. Dual layer boards really are awesome. And yeah. not just for keeping things in place. You know, you, you knock the table and things on those flat boards go sliding away. The dual layer boards keep them in place. But on top of that, they give you extra accessibility. Mm -hmm. Players uh, with vision disabilities can feel locations on the player boards, can learn by touch and work through their player boards by touch without yep. having to read the, you know, possibly small print and, and iconography all over the boards. Yeah, and what they're doing here is you're going to have different shapes for different things, right? So a dual layer board that just giant zones that all feel the same is not as effective as a, a dual layer board that it has different shapes for different things that fit into them. Um, uh, just to call out a particular game, the Terraforming Mars ones are not going to really help all that much with accessibility. They're going to help because you'll get to know where the areas are, but compared to something where each of the different resources is a different shape, it's going to be more accessible. So the more you vary the various holes on your dual layer board, the more effective it's going to be for more players. Absolutely. Now, one I've got to call out since we're talking about accessibility is large font sizes, please. Card game designers in particular, I would greatly appreciate it if you would resize your font based on the amount of text you're using. Do not keep the same font at the same size for the whole game because I'm sure you have that one card that's more complicated than all the rest that takes up the entire box, so everything else has to be a smaller size. That makes no sense. Resize your text. If a card only does one simple thing, make it as big as possible so it's nice and clear. Yes, still, shrink your font if you need to, because you've got that one complicated card, but please don't keep the same size for no reason. This also applies to rule books. You want a large font, please use white space. Make it easy to read. Um, this goes above and beyond, but they include examples and pictures and all that other stuff. But the whole thing is we have moved well past the point when rule books need to look like technical manuals. Nothing I buy in 2023 should look like Starfleet battles. Now, another thing, if your game is complex and you have a thicker rule book, say more than six pages, Please include an index, especially once you get to the 40 plus page mark. I own games that are over 40 pages that do not have an index and I hate them for it. And to be clear, we do mean index, not table of contents. Yes. Table of I contents both. are great too, but at a certain page count, index is what's really needed. Now, something we talked about in our episode about board games that are too pretty is using artwork to sort and differentiate things. Matching board colors to sections of the rulebook for easy lookup, resources that can be spent in a different format than reasons, resources that accumulate, uh, all of the cards for one type of unit in the same color, uh, you know, separate things, make things obvious. Yes. You don't have to just use a tiny little icon up in the corner. Yeah, totally agree on this one. We've seen this. I, I've seen it done great, and I've seen it done poorly. Uh, 
uh, it just use your graphic design to import art useful information above and beyond it looks cool i think i think is the main point here i uh, listened to our entire episode two episodes ago where we talk about can a board game be too pretty we get into this a little bit more detailed now i'm going to call out another one from the chat thank you red meeple ryan if there is not enough room on a standard poker or euro size playing card use a larger card i think you know one game in particular that we've complained about this quite a bit lately uh, and I'm going to call them out. That is the My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria game. There is no reason that the Ponyville cards are the same size as the cards that go in my deck, especially in a game that comes with other larger tarot sized cards in it. So it's not even like they would need a new die. Please, please use bigger cards if you need to. I get it. If you're shuffling cards, you might want to stick to standard deck size. That makes sense. Um, I, I, similarly, don't use hobbit size cards if you're going to have a lot of information on the cards. So I haven't seen that come up too often. No, but, and we've got someone else in the chat. First time chatter, Dino Corky saying, counter argument, stop having paragraphs on cards in the first place. Now, I guess there yes. are certain games where that may or may not be, be possible, but there are <laughs> definitely some games that tend to get a little on the wordy side and could probably use as much an edit of their card text as they put into their rule books. See, that's a hard one, right? The, a perfect example of that is looking through the history of Magic the Gathering. At one point when I played, I, I, we're going to throw this in there. At one point when I played, the cards didn't explain anything. They just had all kinds of keywords on them. So you would play the card and it would say trample, or you would play the card and say flying, or it would say wall, and that's it. You you would then need to know the rules for what trample meant or what 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 these things meant. But it was simple so, enough at that time that every starter deck came with a little manual inside the box. Yeah, but again, it was like a 60-page manual, so it really wasn't the right answer. <laughs> but play, players got to know them and learn them because there weren't that many of them. Then the next generation came out, and I don't know again when this happened, but all of a sudden, they put all the text for every ability on every card. And I'm like, okay, this is great in a way, but I can now no longer quickly look over at my opponent's, um, I don't even know what you call your player, my opponent's tableau and be like, oh, okay, I know what that does. I know what that does. I know what that does. Yeah, they made the words bold, but like it wasn't easy to see. And I've noticed as concurrent sets have come out, they have really shifted back and forth and back and forth where like certain keywords are so complex. It basically says, see the rule book where other ones are explained. And I've got to say, finding that perfect balance has got to be difficult. Magic's like the most popular card game in the world, at least for hobby gamers, and they still haven't figured out exactly how much text to put on cards. Absolutely, especially the longer the game is out there and the more complexity they feel they need to add uh, with each additional expansion moving on, uh, they're, they're really kind of trapped between uh, too little and too much yeah. uh, because they, they want more gameplay without more confusion. And now, what I got to ask is, why didn't Magic come with a single card the size of the rest of the card that was a reference that just listed this, what, eight different special effects at the time, right? That was just that that's that quality of life improvement that was missing back when we used to play. And honestly, I don't know. Do they do one now? Is there is there like a player handout that you can have for all the abilities for Magic? Uh, I, I think Magic to me, Magic seems like one of those games where you're supposed to know that stuff. Uh, it's part I, of the part of the gatekeeping of the system. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Um, so we talked a bit about, uh, dual layer boards, but to, another thing you can step up is everything else, right? Uh, deluxe components, deluxified, whatever term you want, board game bling, whatever term you care to use is, is, can be fantastic quality of life improvements. Again, especially for anyone with a disability, these can greatly help with accessibility, but even as an able-bodied person, I just love having some of these upgrades. Now, I don't want to get into the argument, what's better plastic or wood? What's better minis or meeples? That's a personal choice. And I know there's people on both sides of that fence, but the important part is have it. So those minis or meeples are unique so that things are differentiated by more than just color of a cube. You've got metal coins is an upgrade that you think wouldn't matter so much, but as an able-bodied person, it's just so nice and they clink and they feel awesome. But as someone with a disability, having a textured coin where you can tell what the nomination is by touch, it's fantastic and makes games that are possibly unplayable before now playable. 
you're talking about all the other different things you can do to improve various resources, player boards. Even if you've got six different player colors and have the player boards have different edges, that's just something to help differentiate them. Yeah. And along with that, varying your cubes. If you have three resources, don't give me three different colored square cubes. Yeah. Just changing the cube color is not enough. Give them shape, give them texture, give blind meeples, give seeing uh, elderly meeples, whoever, an ability to reach out and differentiate not only by touch, but at a glance. Yeah. You know, make it really easy without any confusion as to what is your, you know, energy level and what is your titanium level. Now, here's one you don't see all that often that I wish were in more games. And I don't even think of this until I see it. And then I'm like, oh, more games should do that. And that is a separate sheet or sheets showing you how to quickly set up the game. At a minimum, give me a two page spread in the rule book right at the start. So I know exactly where to look to figure out things like how many cards does everyone start? That is the one that kills me the most. How many cards does everyone start? Every game. Most deck builders is five. Sometimes it's six. Every now and then it's four. Oh, first round, one player only gets three. I'm about to play birds of a feather. Okay, wait, how many players do we have? How many cards do I have to deal out? Please tell me how many cards everyone gets. Tell me what starting resources people get. Show me what goes out in the map. Show me what's, where things are supposed to go on a player's board if you haven't already made that clear by making a dual layer board. Please show me a quick way to get the set up game set up as someone who teaches games and someone who brings games to public play events, anything you can do to help me get to the game, to the table quicker and get people playing is appreciated. And now I find this, especially when there are a lot of different ways to set up depending mm -hmm. on player counts, the number of times I have been st setting up a game only to realize that I have to tear it down and start over again because, oh, I'm only playing with three players, not with four. And that's a custom thing that is only mentioned 18 pages later in the mm -hmm. back of the book. Uh, 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 Mar uh, Marvel um, Legends, uh, Mar uh, Legends, uh, that, that, that one, the one, the one behind me there, that one to play. You, there's a solo Marvel game. Marvel Legendary. Legendary. There's a solo play but they don't actually give you how to set up the solo play. Huh. They only give you how to set up the normal wow. game. And then you have to find a paragraph of text telling you all the different changes that have to be made mm -hmm. to set it up for solo play. And it was infuriating because it didn't explain it well at all. Wow. Uh, and I very nearly gave up and said, I don't really, <laughs> really need to play this game that much. Yeah, uh, I, this is another one that, that's important for the, the do, we were talking about double sided player boards. I've messed that up so often. You know how frustrating it is to set up an entire game of tapestry and have everything up and then realize you got it on the wrong side of the board. Or another one was um, Horizon Zero Dawn. Yep. We didn't figure out until the fourth punt playing with <laughs> Tori and Kat that the, the boards are two sided. Like we knew they were two sided. And the problem is they say A2 on both sides. And I thought one side was a, and one side was B. So when the encounter cards came out that showed how to lay the boards out it said, Oh, they're all A's. And I'm like, Oh, I guess I grabbed them all properly. They're all A's. There we go. What well, ends up a two has a one to two player side and a three to four player side. And a couple times we had one to two player sides out when we were playing three to four players. So we played extreme. That's a co-op ish game. So I guess it wasn't that bad, but like if that was clearly explained somewhere, I wouldn't have made that mistake. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna label your boards A and B, label the same side. Like two A and B should be opposite sides. There's no yes. reason for numbering them the way they did in that game, in Horizon Zero Dawn, the board game. Those boards are numbered wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's... there's no way <laughs> to justify what they did. It's just wrong. <laughs> there you go. And and include more than one. Also, like we're saying this, but like. Yes, it's great if you give me the standard player setup, kind of like Sean said with, with thing, but include multiple sheets. Heck, two side. If you have a two sided board, give me a two sided how to set up the game sheet. So then I make sure I'm on the right side of that. Uh, so, is this a tapestry? I think is one of the ones that did a really good job of this, except for the fact that I've multiple times set up on the wrong side, but it, it was really good for that. But like even just the, the two played spread where it just says one, do this, two, do this, three, do this, four, do this, with it all graphically showing there. Many games do it. 
more games should do it, but also pull that out of the rule book. So the next time I go to play, I can just reference that and I don't need to find it in the book. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's no reason to hide information from your players, especially when it's the opening of the game. When this is how you're going to get the game started, get the game played. If you don't want your players to play the game, fine. Don't don't tell them how to start. But <laughs> otherwise, let us know. All right. Now we're getting to uh, to a little more high level and something that, that, I don't know, seems to be like a hot topic for us this year. In the last year, we have mentioned onboarding a whole lot. And I would like to see more onboarding in board games. Now, this can come in all kinds of different forms. There's no perfect way to onboard someone to your game, but things like a quick start guide or a tutorial or an intro mission or a sample starting hand or even Catan did this. Going back to like Y2K, it had a standard board set up that gives you a balanced board that doesn't give anyone an advantage. Having that would be awesome. Now, this is tricky because I've seen awesome ones that do it right where you get your quick start guide and it leads you through your first game or your first two turns or your first year. And I've seen terrible ones where basically it says, all right, set this up as said in the main rule book. And then you have to go to the main rule book and read it. Then you go back and go, okay, then you're going to start playing this adventure. But when you open the door, check out this section of the main rule book and you're flipping back and forth. Um, I'm sure everyone listening probably is thinking of a specific game right now, but I've seen this enough different places. You all could be thinking of different games. There's other ways to do this too, like just simpler rules for the first play. Leave this in the box. Enemies don't act for the first two turns. Ignore the event phase. What I'd love to see is like a short campaign that slowly introduces rules. Now that one's hard to pull off. Yeah, that that's that's tough. But again, that goes back to our episode about uh, what board games can learn from video games. You know, yes. slowly working people into it. If you've got a complex game, don't start people off cold with all the rules and all the abilities. Give them a couple of turns adding new things or a couple of rounds adding new things and teach people how to play. Uh, and then once you've done, you can put that, you know, slide that book into the bottom of the box underneath all your inserts yeah. or what have you. And you don't need to uh, have it again, but not having it makes a big difference. No, it's true. And I've seen some great ones like, like Race for the Galaxy. I, I know Deanna's not a fan of this teaching method, but as you play through a starting hand, there are numbered cards and you give the cards to players and you go, okay, you play this card. Okay, you play that card. Okay, you play that card. Okay, you play that card. And now we're going to run this phase and see how it affects everyone. Now you guys finish playing. And and I admit it's 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 kind of annoying and it feels very hand-holdy. And as a, as a gamer, you kind of want to say, ah, I'm an experienced gamer. I know what I'm doing. But you know how many people I hear complain about the iconography and Race for the Galaxy and confusion over the turn order who've never played this? So of course there is, because the game gave you a tool to learn this stuff and you threw it out thinking you were too smart. Use this stuff if it is provided. Yeah, and our, our perfect example that we've, we've talked about in the past and I think learned from the video games the way they should is Sorcerer's Arena. Source Arena started off as a mobile yeah. game. And like most mobile games, when you first start the game, you haven't unlocked all the different things you can do and all the different zones you can play in. You just have a few characters and you go and yet you, you sling spells at somebody else. Well, the board game does the same thing. Your first game, you have two characters and they don't have any fancy abilities. You're just moving around and learning the board and then you play the next mm -hmm. chapter and the next chapter. And then by the fourth chapter, it's here you go. Here's all the rules. Yeah. Have at it. And it's a fantastic way to onboard someone into this game. And yeah, sure. It, it took an extra four, maybe six pages of the rule book. Mm -hmm. Is that really that hard? Yeah. And I know a lot of gamers and even the designer is like, Hey, Here's the the full rules right from the start for you hobby gamers because hobby gamers ask for it. I might bite the bullet. I'm a hobby gamer. I have thousands of games. I'm surrounded by them. I played all of well, all but six percent of everything down here. And and I I learned I didn't actually learn anything, but like it worked. It didn't take that long, especially the first game where you only played at ten points. Next game's only to fifteen. Like I managed to get to the fourth chapter in one night of playing. It's not like it took that long. Absolutely. Sorry not to attack every gamer's ego out there, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, be humble. Like if they provide the onboarding, use it. 
It, it mainly be the the one that bugs me is the race for the galaxy one because I I hear people oh that game is too hard. I'm like, well, did you go through the tutorial in the book? Huh? No. And I'm like, well, it, it's there for a reason. Yeah, I I think really you know instructions, rule books, and other paper or digital aspects of teaching and referencing the game. We've talked about a mm -hmm. whole bunch of different you know different things you can use. They really are some of the easiest and most important aspects that any publisher can take some extra time on for yeah. a lot less cost than many other component editions. You're not, you know, chipping in for metal coins or buying the latest game trays, custom molds. Um, you know, when we've been discussing uh, in this in our Discord, the first thing that came up for most people uh, when, when we talked about this in our Discord was rule books, references, index, references. extra yep. cards, you know, ways of get, keeping that information fresh. It's a sore point mm -hmm. with many gamers, and it's something that I think that a lot of publishers could really learn from. Yeah, if you're going to spend five years developing your game, don't spend five days writing your rulebook, right? Like, we we see this a lot with uh, with Kickstarters and indie designers and, and, and things, and Sean's got more of a, a burr about this <laughs> than I do, but... I, I spend time on your rule book. Your rule book is how you're imparting your knowledge of how to play the game to the players do like should do the best job you possibly can on that. That's one of the most important parts of your game. Uh, how many times do we open up a game and immediately there's already an FAQ. There's already a rule summary. I'm like, oh, how did you miss this stuff? And this is going to come up tonight during our review. So it's, it's a common problem. And it just, I, I think people are like, my game's done. Let's go. Let's get it out. Oh, yeah, the rules. Yeah, this is how you play. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, blind playtesting is still either not done or not understood when it is done far too often. Now, here's one uh, from Deanna, my wife, that I hadn't thought of. She brought up because I was sitting in, the, in, the, in, the, in our office working on this. And I'm like, hey, what are quality of life improvements you'd like to see? And we overlapped on a lot, but she called out one that I hadn't thought of. And that is include something to indicate what color, what faction, what team each player is playing. So you can quickly look over and see who owns what. Now, one of the reasons for this is you want to be able to do that without giving in the way that you're looking. Because in she likes the heavier strategy games, right? So you don't want to have to say, oh, what color are you again? Because as soon as you ask that, you have a tell saying, oh, you're now looking at where my pieces are on the board. Now, in some games, this is totally redundant, especially if you have a whole bunch of playing pieces of that color in front of you, or if you're playing a game where everyone's got their own deck of cards or whatever. But in other games, it's just, it, 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 we find we're missing them. There was something we were playing the other day, and I was like, what? wait a minute, there's nothing here to indicate what color you're playing. And I can't remember which game it was. I think it might have been the stat, the the ladder climbing, which I'm totally drawing a blank on. Japanese game about going to the temples and first and last place lose. And it's whoever's in the, no, no, that's, oh, no, that's uh, the samurai yeah, battle one. one. Right. I, I'm totally drawing a blank. And it might have been that where we kept forgetting, like, who was who? Who was in what spot? Now, when you're, when you're, no, not Takedo. That's not it either. Begins with an S, I think. If I, if I go look around, I could probably find it. But yeah, I, yeah. Uh, there it is, Shikoku. There we go. Found it, Shikoku. Um. So now, depends who you play with on this. Now, our home group, everyone knows I'm playing yellow. Uh, D is playing green. Jen is playing blue. Gwen's playing whatever's left over. Right. So I'm playing with my family and my kids. We don't tend to make this mistake. But man, I go to the barbershop bar and I play a game. Especially if someone else takes yellow, I'm lost. I have no idea who's who. I will move the yellow player's piece at some point during the game because I always play yellow. But I, just something, something quick and simple that indicates what color everyone's playing or faction, whatever. It doesn't have to be color. Now, another one, and this is a little one, and I think this is, is, is less important these days than it used to be, but every once in a while it still slips in, is some form of score tracking. I shouldn't need to grab a piece of paper and a pencil to score my game in 2023. Uh, looking at you, Quirkle, this could be a pad of score sheets, uh, a dry erase board, or even an app you can download, which is, we've got a great example of this coming up in a review later tonight, but something that breaks things down. So you don't have to look at your score, trying to figure out all the different pieces or, 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 you know, 
there's a lot of different ways to score and, and different, you know, depending on the game, this could be more complex or, or easier. Uh, but, you know, something simple like what they had on the uh, Sh- Valeria, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, where you've got, you know, five different things that you're scoring or six different things you're scoring. You put a number in each one. There's enough space that if you want to track as you're going along, mm-hmm. you can do tick marks or write numbers, whatever works for you. Uh, it just makes it easier for everyone at the end of the game. And honestly, having these two helps during the game. Having a score sheet is a way to point out to players, how do you win this game? Especially when you're getting into Euros, Stefan Feld style point salads. It's really easy to forget some of the different scoring opportunities, as well as completely forgetting what the game is about because you're lost in doing the actions. Um, you're playing your game and you're moving all your units on your map and you've collected a ton of gold and you have all these resources. Then you get to the end of the game and lose because it's actually all about the zones you control on the map. And you would get that if you look at the score sheet when zone control is worth this much, extra resources are a tiebreaker. Oh, okay. I guess I shouldn't have held on to so many resources. Yeah. And that's, that's a real problem. I will say my, myself, I have on more than one occasion, uh, gone after the wrong thing because it's not obviously clear. You know, yeah, you want a lot of good coin. Well, except coin doesn't actually score anything in this game. Yeah. It's just about buying the resources you actually need. And another another thing here is is this is a side note. All right, side note. A tabletop bellhop. I don't. We can, we need a term for side notes. Tabletop bellhop side note. Pay attention to what that tiebreaker is. This is a game design tip. By making something the tiebreaker, you make it more important than every other resource in the game, except for whatever scores you the points. So just a heads up, if you're making the game, you're like, most apples at the end of the game is the tiebreaker. That now makes apples more important than bananas. So just just a heads up to watch for that. And as a player, be aware of this. If there's something that is a tiebreaker and you've got a turn that's kind of middling where you're not advancing a lot in points, well, collect a bit of that tiebreaker, whatever it is, just in case. All right, next one I would like to see more of is backstory, fiction, artwork. Throw me some theme. I love it when a thematic game goes all in on its theme. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily, like, don't overdo it. We Again, two episodes ago, we talked about going too far with this. Make this separate from the game. Uh, mainly, you see those licensed games where you'll pick up a game and there'll be a lore book with it. Horizon Zero Dawn came with a, a whole book about the world of Horizon Zero Dawn. I, but other games do it well just as well doesn't have to be licensed now a really weird one that i own that i find fascinating that does a bit of this is space base there are bits in this book about the various ships and the factions and this ship is used to explore this part of space where they found the blah 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 nebula that matters not at all while playing space base space space is is a fairly abstract game it's a role for resource game where you're an engine builder no combos in that. I guess there's combos in that one. Sorry to go back to an earlier topic on engine builders. It's an engine builder either way. None of this matters. But you can tell someone at AEG All Direct Entertainment Group has a whole world made for space base and loves interjecting these little parts. Like, I want to play the game with that one. So every time they, like, launch a ship, they tell me its mission it's on. <laughs> I love seeing little extra bits like that. Like, like just the thematic, like, includes some, some backstory, some extra artwork, some... I, I game, Some games have soundtracks. Uh, Venturia. One of the things I liked about playing Adventuria on tabletop simulators, it had an Adventuria soundtrack. And I'm like, oh, it's just cool. You put on background music while you're playing the game to kind of increase the immersion. I love that kind of stuff. Now, you can argue that this also could go the other way. And again, this goes back to the things we have talked about recently. Uh, it could be at some point able to get in the way of the rules yeah. and the other important bits that you actually need to get the game to the table. So do find that balance uh, between, you know, having the interesting immersion, but still make sure that you can get the game to the table and you're not tripping over, you know, what the Gamma Quadrant exploration ship does when you really just want to know how many cards do I start with? Yeah, true. There's definitely a fine line there. Uh, Darkling Blight in the chat room is calling out Thunderstone Quest go so heavy on the story and lore that doesn't translate into gameplay all that well when you're actually playing. So like, like to me, this is more like the extra 
like don't it, not putting too much story in the game, but like giving me some extra background and text, like as opposed to trying to throw in too much in the game. So I, I, there's a balance there. What I what I was calling out is the quality of life is like I have Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy and there's an art book. Like it, it, I don't need the art book when I'm playing. I don't reference the art book when I'm playing. But you know what? When I got some downtime and I'm going to the coffee shop, I can bring that and flip through it and go, ah, this is some cool stuff here. And then next time I play the game, I might appreciate some of the stuff in the game more. So I'll be like, oh, that's the faction that did this thing. All right, one of the ones I'm sure people knew we were going to bring up here, and and Sean should probably be the one talking about this more than me because I think he's bought more of them. And that is a big box when a game grows so that it can no longer hold all of its contents due to multiple expansions. Now, personally, I like it way better when this is part of a bigger expansion that also gives you new stuff and not just the box um, to the best one I have ever played or best example of this still to me is the Galactic Orders expansion for Core Worlds. Core Worlds comes in a fairly small box that holds everything you need to play in it. Well, the first expansion actually came in a bigger box than the base game. And some people complained about this and they're like, why is the expansion bigger than the base game? And I'm like, yeah, but now it all fits in the expansion box. And then some people complain that they want it. They want it to say core worlds, not galactic orders. And I'm like, whatever, you're being silly. This is brilliant because now I can fit my base game and that expansion. And they even planned ahead because it fits the next expansion as well onto one box. And I got a whole expansion at the same time because I got to say galactic orders is fantastic. And if you play core worlds, you haven't played core worlds until you use the galactic orders. <laughs> Uh, it's it, it just all around great. And I got to say, I love being able to keep all of my games. If I, in an ideal world, every game I owned would be one box to have everything I need to play it in one spot, including expansion content. Like I go far enough to buy box inserts for games where the publishers haven't provided a big box. I'll try to find some solution that uses the existing box to, to do it. A, a great example of this, and I'm still shocked it works is Battlestar Galactica, the game, has three expansions with one box insert. All four boxes is combined into one, and it works. I, I love that. I'm like, oh, oh my Battlestar Galactica no, no longer takes up 25% of a shelf. This is great. Yeah, and now not only adding new content, but better ways to use the content that you've collected that has required this new box. So shout yeah. out to Cryptozoic for the randomizer systems that come with the multiverse box. So you don't necessarily even have to decide what you're, what parts you're going to be playing with. They've put in, uh, as well as having a multiverse expansion that comes with the game, they built an entire randomizer system so that you can help figure out what parts of the, uh, yeah. the DC deck building you want to use. Next up to go with the big box, I want a big book. I like big books and I cannot lie. I want a universal rule book after your game has multiple expansions. One of the things that's driving me bonkers right now with Disney Sorcerer's Arena is when a character uses a status effect and I got to remember which, uh, okay, what character was that? Okay, which expansion? Okay, now I got to find that book because my, my game is now a multi-chapter big book and four little tiny books to figure out exactly what no punchbacks does. I give me all of the info in one place. Now, a great example of this is the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Core Set, which sounds like it's the first part of a product, but it was actually a relaunch of a game line where they took everything from all the different expansions that had ever been published and put it in one thick book. Now, I admit that thick book is intimidating and kind of reads like a technical manual, but it saves you having to look up anything. It's all in one place. Now, another example that did it a little different, because what that did is you just read the rule book, start to finish. And it just makes sense. You have a, it, you wouldn't know there were expansions in there. Now, Castle Panic Big Box did something a little different. What it did is it just included all the rules for the different things in order they were released. So in one book, you've got the Castle Panic rules, you've got uh, the Wizard's Tower rules, the Dark Titan rules, and so on. And they're they're in there. Uh, personally, I would have liked they were color coded a little better so you could jump to the different sections. But I do dig the fact that, again, I have one book. I don't have to look around for the different books. Another one is the Anachrony Infinity Box, which, again, put out a nice, thick, solid rule book that taught you everything. And interestingly, what they did is they pulled the expansion content into a separate book. So here's the core rules for the game, but here's all the expansion content. And that game has a lot. It has a lot of these little modules 
where you're like, I'm just going to add in a disrupted timeline. Or I'm just going to add in an end of the world track. Or I'm just going to add in a new faction. All of those are in a separate book. Absolutely. There's definitely a lot of games that do it right. Unfortunately, there are still a number of games that do it wrong. But now let's look at our top six existing quality of life improvements. Uh, why don't we do three from each of us? All right. We're going to wrap up with this. So just a heads up to the chat. If you have anything else you want to share, we'll be looking for your comments next. So for me, this is an easy and kind of obvious one. And that is the new multiverse box not the one up here not not this one that's the old one the new multiverse box from cryptozoic for the dc deck building game they have really vastly improved it over the original with more ways to hold the various sized cards which was the biggest problem in the mm -hmm. original one where they had multi multiple sizes of cards but only one size of receptacle uh, they've added deck boxes for all the different components that have come out nice. and all the things. And they've actually lowered part of the insert that's built into the box to accommodate rule books and things in one section. So while they haven't come out with a giant rule book, which would be nice, they have given you space to store all of your rule books. Now, is this the one you backed or the one that's coming out that is the next one? No, this is the one I backed. So This uh, is the one you backed. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things I remember you complained about this is the way they had put the sticker on the box for the artwork that stuff was getting caught. Is that uh, that, was the, or the last one? that was the original? That was the that was the original one. Is yeah. that fixed? Yep, they've 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 really gone over and above. They've they've listened to listened to people or or looked at it themselves perhaps and and <laughs> figured out. Oh wait, we didn't do this quite right. Yeah, the fold over on the uh, on the on the the the, the original box cards would catch in it. Yep. So I'm going to call out one we didn't mention, though we kind of talked about organizing components, but tuck boxes. I talked about bowls and trays and game trays and stuff. Tuck boxes are awesome. Um, most recently, Fighting Fantasy Adventures used those to sort out the different decks. It was just a prototype and they used tuck boxes. I need to make more tuck boxes. It just it takes time. Like at Board Game Geek, you can pretty much find tuck boxes for everything. I would love to make tuck boxes for, say, Adventuria. But to go with that, our other card holding boxes are a nice upgrade. Like if you give me some way to sort my cards out of the baggies as a bonus. And the other one I'm going to call out, which I know was in Sean's multiverse box is dividers. If you were going to give me a deck building game or anything else where I'm only going to use part of the game at once, give me dividers to sort the cards, please. And, and to be fair and listen, folks, those plastic inserts where you build the divider physically in to separate them, they don't really work that well. It, you're way easier just getting an actual physical like bookmark that you can slide in there and save yourself the molding space. For props on a good one, except it only works when you own the big box, the um, Disney Smash Up had like nice thick card ones that were also a reference on what that dick did and how hard it was to play, which I thought was really cool. All right, my first one, I've already mentioned at least once or twice tonight, <laughs> is the infinity box for anachrony. And honestly, this whole product, yes, there's a new new way to play and there's an expansion in there, but really it's just a bunch of quality of life improvements thrown together. One, a giant box, you can see it behind my head, anyone who's watching this on video, to hold everything in one place, including every single expansion. And as I mentioned, there's a lot, but not only hold the expansions, there are game trays inserts that sort everything. So every expansion has its own tray. So you literally, if you're like, I want to play with the Shattered World expansion, you have a tray for that. That is amazing. There is also individual player trays. There's a thing that shows you what goes where and how to stack it all. Yes, it's a book because there's that many different trays in this game, but it's all there. Component in upgrades that replace a lot of the cardboard components with plastic tokens and a lot of the plastic resources with metal, a combined rule book, and a lower art book, and so much more. It's like half the stuff we mentioned tonight is included in that box. That is one of the most impressive. You know, you guys love this game. You folk love this game. We're going to give you a new expansion, but we're also just going to add everything you've ever asked for. Here you go. And that's what that felt like to me. So my next one is, is sort of silly and simple, but at the same point, it actually made a big difference. So when playing Azul, the original Azul, a big problem, depending on where you were playing and, and, and where you what kind of uh, 
game uh, gaming experience you were having is knocking that player board and shifting your mo shifting your uh your your pieces around and things sliding well the crystal mosaic expansion solved that by giving you a crystal mosaic the plastic molded uh dual not dual layer but molded player board so that when you put a tile down it stayed there uh and and while it's not a huge thing it's enough to make a really nice quality of life upgrade for this game for me it's not the tiles it was the scoring piece the little mm. tiny scoring <laughs> yes. cube that was the big one tile shift you usually know where they went where you put them or they're grouped together right but the score token how many times i played as a wound my score token I'm playing, I'm playing, I look, and it's like in the middle of four numbers. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> did I have 25 I, did anyone or 15? Remember what I was at? <laughs> did anyone remember what I was at? Yeah, I, I totally agree. Crystal Mosaic was actually, that was a great expansion, actually, because it also came with two new boards that changed up the gameplay more than I thought they would. All right, the next one I'm going to call out, and this is a quality of life improvement that a lot of board gamers have made to their games not necessarily provided by the publisher and that is switching to using poker chips instead of paper money or coins or whatever the game comes with i uh, or even for scoring i've even seen people that use poker chips just to track your score in high scoring games well i'm going to call it a specific set and those are the iron clays now these were made by roxley games and they were originally included in the kickstarter deluxe editions of brass lancashire and birmingham now they sell these completely separately. You can just go on Roxley's website and buy your iron clays. These are fantastic gamer quality poker chips that just feel good in your hand. They've got the, the weight to them. Yes, they're great for playing brass because they happen to be also the exact same size that you stack your money you spend every turn. But they're also great for any game where you want to replace cardboard, paper money, or like I said, even just for scoring in a game where scoring is obvious so people can look across the table to see what your score is at. And they just feel so nice. They do. They, <laughs> they really, just do. really do. So next one I'm going to bring up is birds of a feather, Western North America, which is a game we're going to be reviewing a little later. And yeah. this is because they put out an app that not only allows you to play the game solo as you're sitting around board, but it's a digital scorekeeping app which takes all the hassle out of scoring. Now they have a double-sided score pad that's environmentally friendly. Now we all, we complain about the non-double-sided score pads, but they've, they've gone and they've given you double-sided ones. But if you've got a phone, if everyone or everyone at the table has a phone, it is so much easier to score this game by using yeah. the, the freely provided app on your app store of choice. And it's even available on Steam if you, if you'd like. Uh, to score that game, it just makes it easy, uses less resources, and makes for a smoother yep. gaming experience for what's already a pretty easy game, but just makes it that much easier. Also provides background music, but uh, if you're anything like me, you, you, you won't leave that on long. <laughs> and turn off the, the voiceover. That was the, yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Somehow it had voiceover at the beginning. It's very accessible, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am I, I am going to do uh, what do, Roger suggested, board game dispatch uh, or tabletop bellhop uh, dispatch as, as a <laughs> side note. Side note, pro tip. When filling out a, a scorecard like this, where you are just checking off things, this came right from the Birds of the Feather um, rule book, and I thought it was brilliant. This game is all about being environmentally friendly and points out how to use each score sheet three times before you're done with it. The first time you put a slash, the next time you put a slash the other direction, making an X, the third time you filled the circle in. You just tripled your amount of sheets, which I thought was kind of brilliant. All right, my next game, last game, yeah, it's my third, is um, not a game, but an improvement for a game, and that is the Terraforming Mars dual layer boards not the one Stronghold put out, but the ones Deanna got me from Etsy, which I think I might have finally removed from my game because I was gonna I was gonna hold one up, but I couldn't find it in the box. But I I was kind of rushing before the show started. Yes, yeah, Stronghold finally put out official two layer boards, and yeah, they're pretty good. But I'm always gonna have a soft spot for the wooden boards Deanna got me. They only cover up the number tracking part of the boards in the middle, so they're nice and small. They were unobtrusive. They worked great, and they didn't have 
the kind of staggered slot thing for the individual cubes, which is what Stonemeyer or Stonemeyer's the wrong name, Stronghold did for the current board. And I find it's still pretty easy to bump my my numbers by one spot left or right because of the staggered thing. I, I find those annoying on the new boards. I love the one she found me on Etsy. Um, I, if there's still if the shop's still around, I'll be sure to put a link in the show notes. Uh, no, we are at Etsy affiliate, so it'll be affiliate link, but whatever. These are awesome. I like these were honestly, in my opinion, better than the official version. All right. Well, there we have a significant number of quality of life improvements that we'd love to see more of in modern hobby board games. What's something that a publisher can do that doesn't actually impact the gameplay of a game, but that you would appreciate having that would make you want to play that game more? I have a question for us. Hit us up with an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or go over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop.